Two examples. These are really good apples. Honey crisp. Delicious. Would you like one, Susie? You're good? Okay. Lenny, would you like one? Yeah, sure, here you go. Well, what's wrong with it? It's a good apple. Would anyone like my apple? No, you don't want my apple. Why? I already ate half of it, right? And I take really big bites. No, you don't want this apple because I've already started eating it. It's only partial. If I were to offer this to you, there's a number of issues with me trying to give you this apple, right? No, you would prefer a still whole one, right? So why is it any different with God? You see, there's a lot of times where we try to give him a, a half-eaten apple and, and think that's enough. But we read in Scripture that God is a jealous God. God wants all of us. He wants us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. And if you know anything about that, that means everything, right? We need to love God with all that we are. We don't just want to offer him part of our lives. He wants all of it. So let's make sure that that's kind of the way we think about this as we continue through this this morning. Let's offer a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we know you want all that we are, and sometimes that is difficult for us to be willing to give up that control over some things. But God, I pray that each and every one of us would have the Holy Spirit filling us up to offer all that we are to you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Those really are good apples, though. <laughs> What's that? It would be better in a pie, but, you know... I didn't want to get up that early this morning. <laughs> so as always, it's good to remember where we've been before coming till today, uh, just so that we can kind of be prepared for that next stop on the journey. And so if you'll remember, we started this journey through the walk together by talking about the essential practices of the Christian walk. And the first one that we came to was worship and prayer. In those moments together, what we reflected on was the relationship that we have as created beings to God, our creator. And he gives us life. He sustains us even now as we are sitting here breathing together. One, one another, uh, the Holy Spirit is here breathing into us. And really, he's the only one worthy of that kind of recognition, right? That's, that, that is predicated on, on the foundation of gratitude, right? All that we are, all that we have in our being is, is, is uh, predicated upon God sustaining us, creating us and sustaining us. And so that gratitude is the foundation for our offering of worship. It's not about us and not what we get. It's first and foremost about what we thank God for. From there then, we studied, or we, we ventured into the idea of study, right? We, we, the next stop, we talked about studying God. And if you remember what we talked about, there were, there were two kinds of revelation where God reveals himself to us. There's what's called a, a general revelation, and that's where we look at God and we find God in music, arts, nature, and even our intuition, but then we have what's called special revelation. That's kind of the more important one that we focused a lot of our time on. And what we've, we began to realize is that God himself is contained in his word, in his scriptures. And when we read scripture, when we study that, the goal is not about knowing facts and knowledge. That's helpful, but God doesn't really care as much about how much scripture we have memorized if we don't live it out. If we're not living into that relationship with him that we find in that scripture. And so the, the study is really about saying, God, I'm looking to study your word. I'm looking to study you to get to know you deeper, to develop an intimate relationship with you. That's really what studying is all about. Then last week we arrived at serving. That was the next stop on the journey. And in serving, what we begin to do is we see the world around us ever so slightly more each and every time we allow God to work in us the way he sees it, right? We begin to see with the eyes and the heart of God. We hear with the ears of God. We begin to see people as people to be loved. No different from you and I that need that same grace and mercy from God and from others in our lives, right? That's the idea of serving. We begin to have our heart beat in rhythm with God's. And so more than anything, we have to be ready to be interrupted, right? We talked about the Good Samaritan. We remembered how he was interrupted on his journey to the Camel Convention. Remember that? 
There goes the Good Samaritan. He's off to his, his, his time. And there he comes upon this man who needs help. He's interrupted in his journeys. And not only that, he interrupts his own uh, livelihood at some level. And he says, whatever this man needs, take care of it. And on my way back through from, from this convention, I'm going to come back through. I'll pay whatever other expenses he incurs out of my own pocket. Right? He's not just interrupted on his travels, but he interrupts his own income for this man that he probably doesn't even know. Right? That's the interruptib interruptibility that we need to have in our lives to serve people that are made in the same image of God as we are. So now today we turn to a topic that sort of seems a little more out of place. This is probably the one that feels the most um, shoehorned into this, this practice uh, list, if you will. And we talk about giving, right? But why is it, why is it that we squirm and, and struggle to talk about money, even though Jesus himself spent a lot of time addressing the issues that were caused by money and wealth. Not only wealth of money, but of things, of possessions, even time. Jesus addresses these issues that people seem to have with all this wealth that they accumulate. You know, we like to talk about letting God into those areas of our lives and, and even some uncomfortable things. We, we're sort of willing to let God into some of those uncomfortable moments. But when it comes to talking about sacrificial giving, for whatever reason, when it comes to giving of our time, our money, our talents, our service, these are the things where we start feeling a little awkward, isn't it? And I know that because I'm standing up here feeling really awkward, like, I've got to talk about this. Y'all just have to listen. <laughs> I spent quite a bit of time in prayer this week thinking, how do I address this topic faithfully that helps us understand the value of giving as part of the, of the Christian walk? But here's the thing, guys. If Jesus dealt with it as much as he did, we shouldn't be afraid of it or even shy away from talking about it. Our life as Christians is predicated on something very important. And that is the fact that we were created by a very, very generous God. Not only did God create us, but he gave us a special place in the hierarchy of his work, right? Not only did he create this beautiful creation around us and then give us this special place in it, he gave us that creation itself to be managed by us to make fruitful, all right? God literally said, I created all this, I technically own it, but I'm, I'm allowing you, I want you to take care of it. I've given you life. Honor that. Not only that, he showers lavishly upon us, love and mercy new daily, right? Scripture says every morning his mercies are new. That's a generous love, especially when we continually fail him, right? And even when we continually fail him, he still was generous, to the point that he made the most sacrificial act, the central focal point of all of human history, through the cross with Jesus Christ. He withheld nothing to bring us back to him. If that's not generous, I don't know what is. All right? Folks, we were made in the image of that type of generous God. And that means it's meant to be a part of who we are, too. Now, we can tell a lot about our generosity, our, our, our sense of, of who we are, by the way we choose to manage our wealth, especially our resources of time and money. Those are usually the two key ones that we, we, we often sort of neglect a little bit. And I'm guilty of that myself. But here's the thing. If you look back over your taxes from the past several years, take a look at those tax returns, what would they say about you? What would your charitable giving contributions uh, reflect about your generosity? This is a kind of tax selfie. If you know what a selfie is, you take a picture of yourself, okay? These can show us where our heart really is, whether we know it or not. In the, in the book, The Walk, Hamilton shares this story about a, an accountant that he knows named Dan Hutchins. And this was the man who kind of coined that phrase, tax selfie. But he shared with Hamilton um, this, this startling reality of a tax return of a former uh, vice president who made his tax returns public. And they took a look at them. Now, this individual showed an, uh, an adjusted gross income of around $200,000, which sounds like a lot, but for the most part, if you look at politicians' incomes, that's pretty, pretty moderate. I mean, that's pretty average, middle-of-the-road kind of a number. Um, but here's the thing. Out of that income, the charitable giving amount on that tax return for that vice president was a meager $300. That's less than 10 less than one-tenth of one percent of that income was given in contributions to generous nonprofits. Jesus' words from Matthew 6.21 sound quite a bit different when we look at that tax selfie, don't, don't they? 
take on a little bit deeper meaning for us. Today, we run the risk of falling into something that's really dangerous. Today, we run the risk of pursuing something called the good life, right? Who here has ever heard, oh, you're living the good life? We've heard that phrase before, right? Did you ever think that that was a dangerous phrase? I didn't. I honestly never thought about it until I began to reflect on some of Hamilton's words. You see, Hamilton talks about something uh, called this Greek philosophy of hedonism. How many of you know that word? Hedonism. Right? This, this, this philosophy from, from Greek culture, it's a Western philosophy that started way back in Greece. Rome really ran with it as well. But hedonism suggests life is all about maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. All right? That's what hedonism is all about. If it's something you love, if it's something that you enjoy, if it's something you want, and it's going to give you a, a sense of happiness or fulfillment, go for it. Anything that harms you or hurts you or bothers you, get rid of it. That's hedonism. Maximize the good, minimize the bad. Now, in and of itself, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but, but Scripture reminds us we're going to have moments where we suffer, where we hurt. That is normal part of life. It's not about escaping the pain. It's about learning how to endure it. But ultimately, hedonism always fails us. Here's why. Because as soon as you think you've found that next gadget or purse or book or thing that is going to fulfill your life, within moments, suddenly it doesn't fulfill us. There's still a hole there. There's still something more we want because it never fully satisfies that craving of whatever it is. Just ask King Solomon about that. If you look at King Solomon's life, he had all sorts of wealth, and yet he still wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. So if we turn to Ecclesiastes 2, we begin to read some more about what Solomon experienced even as he had all that wealth. And listen to what he says in Ecclesiastes 2. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and delights of the flesh and many concubines. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. Taking without any other context, it sounds like Solomon is having a great time being king, doesn't it? By today's measure, he is living the good life. There is nothing he wants that he can't have, by his own words. But if we realize what Ecclesiastes is all about, what does he call life? He laments the meaningless, pointless vanity that's like chasing after a wind. Because if you take that Ecclesiastes 2 that we just read in context... Solomon's realizing all of that stuff that I could, could acquire for myself still didn't satisfy me. Hedonism always fails us. In order to push back against this kind of thinking in our lives, we need to pursue the Holy Spirit so that he can make a few changes to our approach to wealth. And it begins where we started some weeks ago, with gratitude. Gratitude is the foundation for worship and prayer, but just as much, it's the foundation for our understanding of how we become a generous people. We often neglect to take stock of all the blessings we already have and instead pursue more stuff for ourselves, more wealth for ourselves, more things for ourselves. When we begin to cherish what we already have, when we begin to realize what I have is more than enough, that's when we begin to possess the possessions instead of the other way around. Next to that, we need to live with a purpose. We need to have some type of thing that we are striving toward that isn't stuff. Our lives are given meaning not by collecting and hoarding treasures in this world, but in cultivating our lives around the two greatest commandments, love God with all that we are, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Right? When we begin to put those things in perspective, when we begin to pursue those things alone, everything else hinges upon them. Remember, Jesus himself says that. All of the law and prophets, everything that came before me, hinges upon loving God and loving neighbor. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian neurologist and psychiatrist who survived four Nazi concentration camps, including Auschwitz. That alone sets him a 
pretty high that I want to hear what he has to say. Okay? But in his surroundings, he began to take note of things. You know, as a psychiatrist and neurologist would, he would look around and he would try to understand what is happening, what is the mental processes that are happening around me. And he began to look at those around him who had developed a sense of meaning to their lives, who had a purpose greater than themselves in these concentration camps. And what he found was that it actually gave them help in coping with the bleak situations of life around them at the time. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning, and he reflects on this a lot further in that book, but he gives this bit of wisdom that stuck out. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation of man is through love and in love. We know God is love from Scripture, right? It says it right there. I don't know if he meant it this way or not, but what he revealed was the human condition hinges upon a love that we would refer to as agape love, a sacrificial love, a love that says, I will give my all for your sake, a love that says, this isn't about me or what I get out of this, but how I can do whatever it takes and give whatever I can to show you how valuable you are to God and therefore to me. Those two changes help us begin to reflect on the third part of what the Holy Spirit's necessary work is in us. Becoming the generous, agape, love people that we were designed to be. This isn't just about giving to the church through the offering plate, although that is a good place to start for some of us. Ultimately, though, this is more about being generous toward God in all sorts of ways, and it needs to extend into the world around us. Our sense of giving extends into the world to change the world because of how generous we are. It makes people ask why. It makes people ponder what is going on that is so different about that person that they are willing to do such an amazing thing to sacrifice for me, for, for my sake. What did I ever do to, do to deserve that? You know, when, when we invite folks to join us in membership to our denomination, our book of worship invites us to ask several questions. But one of the questions it asks, it says, will you be willing to commit to supporting this local church family through your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Our generosity needs to extend into each and every one of those things in some way or another. Winston Churchill famously said once, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. To be a part of God's community requires that we approach all kinds of wealth, material and immaterial wealth, with that kind of mentality. And science, once again, supports me in this. Study after study after study reveal that giving actually blesses the giver just as much as anything. When they've done brain scans, they have shown that when we give, the brain's kind of reward center lights up like the Griswold's house in Christmas, right? Some of you who aren't laughing at that need to go watch a Christmas vacation. But, but suffice it to say, the reward center of our brain just goes nuts. I mean, it's like the 4th of July. And not only that, the amygdala, the part of our brain that produces the sense of, of dread, of anxiety, of tension, of uncertainty, all right? That part of the brain, when we give, actually eases up. It actually slows down, figure, you're freaking out a little bit, which is kind of a, a backwards way to think about it, right? You think, oh, I'm giving, giving away stuff. I should be worried about not having enough. But no, the brain actually knows better. It's wired even subconsciously to know when I give, when I have that generous heart in me, there's something good about that. That's really what I'm meant to do. Who knew that when Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive, he was actually right, huh? Who would have thunk it, right? Just think about that for a moment. What do you like more? What gives you more joy? Opening your own gift? Or watching someone else open a gift that you specifically picked out just for them? Think about that. Which is it? Last week I shared a video about a young man who was, who was not only looking around for ways to serve when he realized the need, but was also giving of his time, and others joined him. They gave money, time, resources, gifts, service, whatever, to make sure that kids had desks. It seems so simple, but that gift of a desk helped so many young people and families feel like they had a sense of normalcy as they were doing this online learning thing. 
You know, I was giving Catherine Thomas a hard time when she came in with a, a, a snowflake on her shirt this morning, but I have to confess that the video we're about to watch, I want to show you now, um, is going to talk about Christmas. Uh, I'm not trying to rush us there. I know, she's covering up now. She's a little worried. I gave her some self-conscious thought there. It's okay, Catherine. No, but I want to show you this video. This year for Christmas, what are you hoping to get? A computer. Big, giant Barbie house. A trophy case. Xbox 360. Minecraft Legos. What do you think your mom or dad want for Christmas? My mom would probably want a ring. She's never really had a ring. Jewelry. She loves jewelry. A new TV. Like watches. So, we actually did buy an Xbox 360. What in the world? I wanted this! Okay, you, you really got this for me? A new laptop. Wow! And it's a necklace! So we also bought a necklace because he said you also wanted to get a necklace for your mom or your auntie. The catch is that you can either get a gift for yourself huh? or you can pick a gift for your mom and dad. I need you to pick one. Now, now before you answer, oh, I bet that's hard. Is that a really hard question? Mm-hmm. What gift do you pick? I choose this. I gotta go with the ring. What gift do you pick? That one. That one. That dress. I'll choose this for my mom. I'll choose this one. It's a really tough question. I'll but give him this. You already know? Tell me why. Because Legos don't matter. Lego, your family matters. Not Legos, not toys, your family. So it's either family or Legos, and I choose family. I get gifts every year from my family, and my mom don't get anything. If I get a laptop, my mom will get something. She helps me when I'm sick. She helps me with my homework. She gave me a house to live in. They look out for me and do stuff for me, so I need to give back to them. Now I, I have the opportunity to give him something. Imagine it. Just imagine for a moment. Imagine if there were more people in the world, maybe even some of us, maybe myself included in that. Imagine if we had that kind of generos generosity that those kids showed. When Zacchaeus met Jesus, the unscrupulous tax collector who had built his wealth upon stealing and taking and conniving was changed. And he vowed not only to give away half his possessions to the poor, but anyone he had wronged, he said, I will pay back four times what I owe them. Four times. He's not only looking to return what he stole, but give back that much more. When Zacchaeus realized what treasure was really worth it all, it changed everything about how he viewed his wealth. Maybe it's time we look at our own life selfies and reflect on how generous we are and ask if we really like the picture we see. Amen.